Welcome to this Talks at Google virtual event. I'm Lee Gallagher, and I'm the Director of External Affairs here at Google. I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, and I'm also a big fan. What an honor to have her here with us today, and especially during Women's History Month. Today, I have the great pleasure of inter interviewing Dr. Peggy Whitson. Peggy has had one of the most illustrious careers at NASA. Let's just take off a few of her accomplishments. She was the first woman to command the International Space Station twice in 2008 and 2013. She was the first female and first non-military chief astronaut. On September 2nd, 2017, Peggy set the record for the most cumulative days living and working in space by a NASA astronaut at 665 days. Just think about that, 665 cumulative days. She's had more spacewalk time than any woman in this world and her fellow astronauts affectionately call her the Space Ninja. As you think of questions throughout this conversation, and we hope you will, please be sure to add them to the live chat on the right. We also encouraged you to invite your children to join us. So if they have a question for Peggy, please add it to the chat, and we'd love for you to let us know their age. We especially want to hear from the young girls who might be watching. Dr. Dr. Peggy Whitson, it is my great honor to welcome you to Talks at Google. Here. I'm really thrilled to be here. It's it's uh, great to join you. Uh, I I've been, I enjoyed my previous talks with Google, and uh, I think this will be a, a neat event. Good. Well, we're we're so grateful for your time today, and it really is such an honor to have you with us, especially during Women's History Month. You are um, a hero to so many. So first off, I'd like to ask you, who are your heroes, and who did a young Peggy Whitson in Iowa? look up to for inspiration? Well, I grew up on a farm in rural Iowa. So, you know, the closest town had a population of 32. Uh, that's people, total, no zeros. Wow. <laughs> so, so it was very small, but um, my biggest inspiration was actually my parents. I've, I never have met any more hardworking people than my parents. And we didn't have a lot on the farm and it required every bit of their effort every single day. And I think they were very inspirational to me in terms of their work ethic and dedication to making the farm a success. So they were definitely heroes of mine and definitely people that inspired me and my work ethic, I think. Uh, but then the, the real I would say inspirational event that made me decide I wanted to become an astronaut was when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon for that very first time. I was nine years old and I'd been watching Star Trek and it seemed like a really cool transition that this, hey, this is real. And I, I kind of thought I should be, you know, a combination of Captain Kirk and Dr. Spock and uh, Neil Armstrong. I all together, that's what I wanted to be. <laughs> of course, when you're nine, you want to be lots of things, and you might dream of other things. But I, I think I had some key moments in my life that that kept me really involved in space and exploration and the desire to be a part of that. So. So uh, my role models, at least initially, were you know Neil Armstrong and and maybe the the guys on Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> and you've also said that in addition to that, it was also that your parents specifically instilled in you that you really could be anything you wanted, and you believed them. Can you talk about that for a minute? I I did. I think um, my mom. I remember uh, her telling me that I could be anything I wanted to uh, when I grew up. And, and it was it was kind of a, an interesting story because my sister and I were talking about the big question in life. What do you want to be when you grow up? And and, you know, I, I was only a couple of years older than that nine. And I didn't really want to tell anybody I wanted to be an astronaut because it seemed kind of far fetched to, even to me. And so I, I said I wanted to be a pilot. And uh, my sister said, you can only be the uh, stewardess. You can't be the flight, uh, the pilot. And my mom said, no, you can be anything you want. <laughs> so that's, that was. That's something that's amazing that, that she said that and really instilled that in you. It's so important. Um, I want to skip, skip a little bit and talk about when you applied to be an astronaut, when you first applied you were rejected and you had to apply for more than 10 years before you were accepted. So I think this is really important when we talk about this notion of rejection, resilience and persistence. And you really embodied all three. So can you talk about that? What did that repeated rejection teach you? 
And what advice would you give to young girls or, or young people in general who might be scared to try something just out of fear of rejection, which is so common? Yes. Yeah, so so I, I really honestly believe that if you're afraid of failure, you're never going to find out what you're truly capable of. And being raised on a farm, I think I was, you know, I've seen people that, you know, my folks out there working all the time, doing things that I thought were probably impossible to do, but they did it. And so I think I just kept trying. I kept trying. And, you know, and looking back at it, I would say, I'm not sure why. Um, the, I, I may be stubborn as <laughs> part of that picture, but, um, you know, I had a few people along the way tell me, you know, I was making the biggest mistake of my life, for instance, uh, or that I should, you know, not try and be an astronaut. And, and those, those actually probably motivated me to try even harder. Um, and so I think the rejection uh, was just something that I had to live through. Now, in retrospect, looking back at those 10 years, those 10 years taught me a lot. I was uh, working in Russia on a, with a small team setting up a science, a joint science program with the Russians. It was, uh, so I was getting international experience and I was getting leadership experience uh, and I was learning a lot during that time frame. And that turned out to be why I was capable of being selected as the commander on board the International Space Station and became the chief of the astronaut office because I had learned some of those skills over those 10 years. So even though I really, really wanted to be an astronaut when I was 26, I was actually a much better astronaut and better prepared for what I ended up doing at 36. So. That that's fascinating and a great point. Um, I think the lessons there are, you know, you have to accept that failure may be part of the journey and it's not always going to end up to be failure. And just because you're told no, it, it just doesn't mean that you can't do it someday. It's just not not no in that first of those 10 years or and in the subsequent years. Well, and to remember that the path may not be a straight line. Uh, you know, it may be something convoluted, but if you're learning from the experiences that you're you know, exposed to, if you're taking away lessons, that it, it's not going to be a bad thing, even if it takes a little longer. So we have a lot of parents watching this. So what advice do you have for the moms and dads on how they can inspire and nurture their daughters and sons to be whatever they want? Well, I think probably the biggest thing uh, I, I find that young people don't know what their passion is. For me, I, you know, I saw it when I was nine. And I think young people don't always know what they're what what it is that inspires them or motivates them. And so exposing them to lots of different fields and showing them that there are are people like them, whether it's women or uh, minorities or whoever it might be, showing them that these people are out there and exist as well. And they're doing these kinds of things that you might be interested in. I think it will be inspirational to them and help them find their passion. And it's okay if they don't know what it is when they're nine, uh, you know, but you do want to find something that, you know, when you go to work, it's not just work, it's fun. <laughs> exactly. And you have actually said that you find that age, when you talk to a lot of young people, age eight to 12 in particular is when you can make a particular influence on, on young children. Can you talk about that? Well, for me, you know, I think that was the age group when obviously I was influenced, but when I talk to young people, they... Uh, I just seem, they seem so much more receptive, like eight to 12, they're asking questions, they're looking for what those inspirational things were, what, what's that passion, and they're not afraid to dream about it, and to think it might be possible. So I think, again, from a parent's perspective, you know, encouraging lots of different ideas and thoughts for them to, you know, think about and dream about is really important. And in, in ensuring that they're, you know, if they need a role model, helping them find one that will motivate them even further. For me, I was lucky. I when I got to NASA, well, actually when I graduated high school, uh, they selected the first female astronauts, and so then it became something. I think it wasn't just a dream for me. It became this is my goal. This is what I want to do. And one of those female astronauts, uh, everyone knows Sally Ride was in that group, but one of them was Shannon Lucid, and she was a biochemist. And I happened to be interested in biology and chemistry. And I already knew that's what I wanted to go into in college. 
And I'm like, wow, maybe I can become an astronaut. So it became something that seemed realistic. So having those role models, I think, is important. So another way to maybe help your young people understand that things are, are out there are options. Yeah, if you can see it, you can be it. So this idea of representation is mentioned a lot. And in recent years, we've had the first all-female spacewalk. And we now have the first female launch director at NASA, Charlie Blackwell Thompson, who will be the first person, who she'll be the person to help launch a woman to the moon. So why is representation so important? I mean, it sort of, you know, touches back to what you just said. But um, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think it's important for uh, everybody to see a reality, uh, see something as being real. Uh, it, it was for me uh, in 2007 when I was commanding the International Space Station was when Pam Melroy, who was commanding the space shuttle, arrived to the space station and docked. And it was the first time there were two female commanders of two different spacecraft on, on orbit at the same time. And I think it was really cool because it was a coincidence that it happened. Um, it was just because the the numbers of females in the astronaut office had increased to around 25, a little more than that percent, but around that area. And by the time the young ladies did the spacewalk together, the percentage is now up to 35 to 40 percent of the office is female. And so things are, you're gonna see these things a little bit more often. And we had the first female flight director in Houston. So the, the launch director is different than the flight director. The We've had female flight directors in Houston. And in fact, on expedition 16, as the commander, I also had a female flight director who was leading my mission from the ground and a female flight surgeon. And, and, you know, and we actually took this really cool photograph of mission control with all the ladies that worked mission and control that were female as well as uh, me on board. And I thought that was fun. <laughs> Very powerful flight surgeon, all the things that you have to think of. And we'll get to that in a minute, but, um, uh, Dr. Mae Jameson was in 1992, became the first black woman to travel in space when she orbited the earth for eight days on the space shuttle Endeavor. Um, what impact did she have and how can we increase representation from everyone, from all groups in space travel? Well, I, uh, you know, and May will actually tell you that she was inspired um, also by Star Trek because there was a, you know, Lieutenant Uhura was uh, African-American and um, it, it, it I think seeing that seeing and being it uh, is true and doesn't even necessarily have to be a reality to, to want to be something. Uh, and May was you know, also very motivated and just pushed to do that. But I think what it does is it inspires people. And we've had you know, numerous uh, African-Americans on board space station. We have one on board right now, uh, Victor Glover. And uh, it's, it's something that makes it real to people. Um, and, and I think it's important for minorities to see that. It was important for me to see a female in that role to make it real for me. So I think it's important for minorities as well. You know, it's often said um, that when women join boards, for example, or the executive ranks, they bring a different style than their male counterparts in a way that is helpful. Uh, more consensus building, greater empathy. This is not, I'm not just saying this, this is not, this. there is a school of thought based on research around these attributes. In the context of a space flight, are there attributes or characteristics, leadership or otherwise, that you feel that women bring to the table that are uniquely helpful and complementary in that particular environment? environment? Well, of course I'm biased, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I actually, I think, I, I, I not only think that, but I, I think our astronaut office uh, was made up of pilots and engineers and scientists, physicists, you know, astronomers, uh, biochemists, and you have people from diverse backgrounds. You have people coming from a farm like me or living in, you know, heavy duty cities. And it's, it's a very different diverse backgrounds that make people able to solve much more complex problems by bringing all these different thought processes together. And I think that's really important. So I think diversity is a strength on any team because it's going to give you different ways to approach a problem and solve, a, uh, come up with a new solution or a unique solution by taking advantage of all those team members. 
but yeah, I am biased. I think women pri provide more. <laughs> <laughs> We're just saying. Um, the photos we see of you in space, you are always smiling and looking like you're having so much fun. It literally is a look of pure joy. Can you just give us a glimpse into what life is like up there and what makes it so much fun? I think it, part of it has to do with just living in an environment that is so different than the one here on Earth. On Earth, you know, we have grown up with the rule of floating in space, or excuse me, that the rule of gravity. So everything is based on gravity. You know, the papers lay on your desk. Right? We sit in a chair. All these things are based on gravity. And when when you don't have that, uh, then you know things change, and we have to adapt to this new environment. And it's it's fun to actually learn to live in space. I was on orbit for about three weeks uh, and I was hanging on the wall in my crew station, in my sleeping bag. I woke up and I was on the computer uh, printing off some, uh, some of the messages that came up from the ground overnight. And I was floating across the laboratory and I'm like, I live in space. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just amazing to have this sensation that I have adapted to this place. It's mine. It's it's like my home and it's so different. And the novelty doesn't really wear off because, you know, the new guys show up and you, you want to play little tricks on them. <laughs> you, you'll ask them, throw me, you know, throw something across the laboratory, throw me, you know, the pen I need or whatever, and they'll throw it and it'll invariably hit the ceiling because their brains are still compensating for a gravity that doesn't exist up there. And then, you know, you return to earth and you try and throw something in a trash can and it drops at your feet because you've forgotten how to do that. You actually really do adapt that much to this new environment. And I just find that novelty interesting, challenging, challenging at times, but you know, I, I just think it's so cool to be in a new environment. That's amazing. You have said zero gravity is so much better than you anticipated. And that that sort of you're giving a sense of what you mean by that. Um, so I also want to ask you related to that, um, the view from space. Uh, we're seeing this incredible photo. I think we're going to have it shown up here. Um, can you talk about what you see from this view? And what does that unique perspective do to you? What does it tell you about us and our place in the solar system? Well, when you think about it, we're living in space, in a vacuum of space, and there's we have to have a whole life support system that keeps us alive. So we have, you know, air, oxygen being provided, carbon dioxide being removed. We have water to rehydrate food, you know, to survive. And all of this is being taken care of synthetically. But when you look down at Earth, you realize, well, hey, that whole planet does all that for us. It provides all our oxygen. It even protects us from the radiation with the magnetosphere around it. it and it becomes very much our everything. Earth is our everything. All the living people that we know about, humans live down there. And so it's spaceship Earth, really. And you see that thin blue line, and that's the atmosphere. And you realize how delicate and fragile our planet is without that atmosphere, we wouldn't exist. Um, and so it's it gives you this sense of taking care of our place and the sense of earth is everything. But then you look out to the stars and it is just incredible, the numbers of stars, thousands and thousands and thousands. And you realize this is just in our little solar system and there are billions and billions of solar systems and galaxies out there. And it's it's mind boggling, the expanse that we're talking about. And uh, I, I just I find that it's such an interesting perspective that you know you look at earth and it's our everything. And then you look out and you're like, wow, I'm not even a grain of sand in the cosmos, not even. <laughs> and so you get this really cool sense of perspective and appreciation uh, for our lives and uh, our place in this place. 
And we'll talk in a, in a couple of minutes about whether, you know, more and more civilians will have the chance to do that. But uh, but that's fascinating. And just getting back to the sort of tricks you play and the, the fun you have. I mean, you celebrate holidays, you celebrate Christmas. There was a picture of you, um, we don't have it today, but I saw it where you donned a Santa hat and some socks and you had presents. So you do, you are kind of replicating to the degree you can uh, the, the, the facets, facets of life on earth up there. Definitely. And I think, you know, it, it's uh, building a team and a camaraderie with your group uh, by integrating, in our case, all the international cultures and different traditions from those uh, is a fun way of sharing uh, and, and joining together and being close. Uh, to the group of people that you're with on orbit. So, you know, we we would take turns like, I, you know, on I would take up the Christmas dinner and somebody else would take up the New Year's celebration and then we'd have a, a Russian New Year's celebration. And so, you know, and everybody was responsible for a different meal for, you know, group meal so that we could uh, celebrate together. That's and great. Share yeah. And can we talk for a second about the space suits? So, the, is it true that the first female space, all female spacewalk was scrapped because the suits didn't fit? Have they solved that problem now? Well, we would all love to have a personalized suit that fits us because that would make the job a lot easier. Inside the space suit, you're working against a lot of the pressure that actually is protecting your body against that vacuum of space. And it's a very expensive endeavor to build spacesuits. So we have three basic torso sizes. They are medium, large, and extra large. And at the time when that they were gonna originally do the two female spacewalks, they had only configured one medium torso and one large torso. Uh, they later then configured two medium torsos so that they could do the spacewalk with the two ladies. Um, so it's possible to do. You just had it just hadn't taken the time to configure the suits properly for the best fit of everyone. And and you know you can do it when it's you can do a spacewalk in a suit that's too big for you, but it's much more challenging. And I've done a couple, but I'd also done six previous ones before I did that. So I had some experience to base my abilities on doing those two spacewalks in a larger spacesuit. Uh, and it, it wasn't ideal. <laughs> yeah, because they're challenging no matter what, right? I mean, they're very exactly. difficult. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, in addition to NASA, we now have SpaceX with Elon Musk. We have Blue Origin with Jeff Bezos and Virgin Galactic, Richard Branson as major players and partners. What do you make of that? And do you think the future is a joint partnership with NASA and private companies? And do we need to rely on male billionaires to take us to the next level? What are the pros <laughs> and, and cons of this? Well, uh, if you think about early aviation and how it came about, originally it was a war effort and then became a mail service uh, for the government and then became uh, something that very rich people did because they could afford it. And that was the only way it was initially commercialized. And now, of course, air, uh, commercial air travel is inexpensive and many people can experience it. Um, and I think that we're kind of in the same area of transition. I think real space exploration requires a combination of government, uh, commercial, and uh, international partnerships that are going to sustain something uh, beyond low Earth orbit and beyond, you know, hopefully the moon and Mars. Um, uh, will be sustainable efforts, but it's going to have to be everyone working together because space exploration is very expensive. And so it needs to be a joint effort. And uh, so I do think having more and more people get into space and s have that same perspective, that sense of wonder and awe of how special it is where we live, how, how small we are in this universe, um, is important for more and more people to see and it will have an impact i think on you know how we treat this planet and and where we go and the fact that it is you know exploration really is important for our survival in the future yeah, and related to that, I was going to ask you, there is a lot of buzz around space tourism with civilians competing for a spot or paying for a spot. 
Uh, and, and what do you make of these programs like Dear Moon and Inspiration4? These are planned civilian missions. And should we be putting civilians in space with astronauts, uh, you know, while astro you know, should we be putting them in space while the astronauts spend their whole life lifetime training for this? Uh, I mean, you sort of touched on that just now, but take it further. I think, I think it's important. More and more people have to see space to have that same inspiration of being there, of to continue the exploration. So I think for our continued exploration, we need more people in space and to see it. Uh, I, you know, I think there's lots of ways you can do it. Um, and, you know, the, the uh, Dear Moon mission uh, and the other one are, are really interesting ways to do that. I know Axiom Space, for instance, is doing it with using um, uh, previously flown NASA astronauts with a crew going to the International Space Station. And so everybody's gonna be doing it slightly different, but it, I think it's great that we're gonna get more and more people in space because I think all of it will inspire everyone more. And of course, in addition to going back to the moon, we now have the Mars Perseverance, which you mentioned, bringing us back incredible pictures from Mars. How big of a deal is this? Put this in perspective for us. And when do you think realistically we might be sending people to Mars? So landing rovers on Mars has been actually very challenging. Um, and NASA has been incredibly successful uh, in the last few years, especially, uh, but so far, other people have crashed on Mars, but nobody else has landed there and had a rover there. They've had many that have surveyed the surface from above. And so it is very challenging to get to Mars and getting humans there is gonna be even more challenging with radiation levels and how, we, how are we gonna keep people uh, alive that long? So we have to have life support systems that are very reliable. I think it's probably realistic uh, in another, 10 to 20 years that we would have people on Mars. I think going to the lunar surface first is a great way to test a lot of hardware and development procedures. One of the things, for instance, they want to try and do is use the regolith, the, the lunar surface or the Mars surface to actually 3D print uh, habitats. And, you know, using the indigenous materials so that you don't have to transfer all of that is going to be important and key in, in making things like that happen. And you could potentially do it robotically in advance and have a habitat set up. And so it's there's some neat technologies that can be explored on the lunar surface that will help us when we get to uh, Mars. I, I would love to go. I, I, <laughs> You're raising your hands right now. <laughs> all right. We heard it here first. Wow. That's amazing. Um, and of course, a shout out to another incredible woman, Diana Trujillo, who led the team of engineers that created the robotic arm for the Perseverance rover. Uh, she has her own incredible life story, immigrated from Colombia, paid her way through college by cleaning houses. So um, there is there is more there's room for for amazing women in space. I think we're that's absolutely. The theme. <laughs> and you know, and it's it's always been interesting to me the diversity of different interests that can get you involved in space. You know, we have people who work in the neutral buoyancy laboratory, a big swimming pool. They're they're divers basically, but they're help they're technical experts in helping you learn how to do a spacewalk that, you know, females do that job. Um, I had met one woman who was heat sealing the inner bladder of a spacesuit that you do a spacewalk in. And her, de her degree was in fashion design. <laughs> and so, so the diversity of people who can be involved in exploration is huge. And I really like to encourage folks to explore some of the different avenues. You don't just have to be an engineer or a scientist. You know, there's there's tons of exciting ways to be involved. And as we expand our um, you know presence in space, we're going to see more and more people who are needed with more and more diverse backgrounds and tech uh, skills. Absolutely. So I want to ask you, we're sitting here in the pandemic one year in, and there was a lot of talk a year ago about how astronauts have a lot of experience being alone and in one place for a long time, which of course is the experience that many of us have now had. Of course, we can go outside, we can do other things, but can you talk about how you have dealt with the pandemic and 
did your space training prepare you for that? And if so, what are what are some of the learnings that you can share with the rest of us? I mean, granted, we're almost hopefully we're at the, the yeah, light at yeah, the end of the, the tunnel. Vaccines, well, I'm <laughs> right. only excited about vaccines, but yeah. No, I think the important thing about space flight that applies to the pandemic is one of the things we have learned with long duration space flight in particular is skills of working well with people that you're close to all the time. You don't get to necessarily pick your crew um, when you're flying on a space flight. And so you have to have the skill set to make sure that that um you can interact with them, you can successfully work as a team, that you are responsive to their needs, they are responsive to yours, you communicate effectively, we call it playing well with others. <laughs> and uh, I think that's one key aspect uh, that has helped um, a lot of astronauts coping with uh, being in isolation during this pandemic. The other thing for me, uh, being on board the space station, some people don't enjoy the whole experience after a while because things get too monotonous. You know, how many times do you have to clean the vents or how many times do I have to fix the toilet? Um, but for me, I, I stay, maintain my motivation by reminding myself that I'm helping keep the space station alive and I'm helping keep space exploration moving forward. And I think for, in terms of the pandemic, um, my motivation was to try and keep people healthy and, you know, have fewer people lose their lives as a result of this, you know, nasty virus. And I think that's, that was the big motivator for me that kept me the big picture motivator. Similarity there. We're we're but we're also maintaining our own households, which is <laughs> more work than we ever thought it was. Um, uh, I want to ask you uh, one more question, and then we'll move to the Q and A uh, from from the the audience. Um, how has the pandemic otherwise impact uh, space exploration in terms of you know has it slowed down operations? Has it cut funding? Have there been any other sort of second second order effects as there have been on so many other uh, industries, et cetera? Well, for sure, I think there's been impacts, but largely uh, for those areas like mission control was always, you know, 24 seven. We had a crew of team, a team of people working in mission control. We've always had, we've maintained people on orbit. Um, and then many of the uh, rocket manufacturing and other facilities have been considered uh, essential and the workers have been uh, allowed to continue working. But the majority of NASA people that are in management and, and other positions that are not considered absolutely essential for the spaceflight mission directly are just uh, working remotely, just like most of the other people in the, in the world right now, uh, trying to maintain uh, their activities and get all their jobs done. Uh, on Teams meetings or or uh, Zoom meetings, et cetera, just like everybody else. Got it. Okay. And now I think we are ready for the first question. I think it should just flash up on screen for us. Uh, I just have to make my screen a little bigger. I can't totally read it. Um, you all probably can. Here we go. How did you feel when you first got into the International Space Station? And this is from Maggie, age seven. So... My first trip, I, I launched and landed on a space shuttle and I got up to the space station and actually even just seeing the space station from the space shuttle was pretty amazing. You could see it from several hundred kilometers away, a, a light that got bigger and bigger and bigger as we approached it and finally docked to it. But it was so much bigger than the space shuttle. We had seven people and it was pretty crowded, uh, not not even probably more than your bathroom <laughs> sized place for seven people to live in. And for uh, uh, when we get to the space station, you you open up into these modules, which are like school bus size. And when I first arrived, there were like four, four different school bus size modules. And so it was a big space by comparison. And now there's up to 15 modules up on board the space station now. So it's a big place. Great, and I think we'll have the take the next question. Should come up here in a second. From Katie Miller, 
The Netflix show Away portrayed a woman astronaut and her struggle being a leader on a spaceship, but also being away from home and her family. Great question. Did you have to deal with similar struggles while in space? Well, I think I'm lucky. And I think Away was based on a, a, a Mars mission, I believe. And the difference is communication is much more difficult in on a Mars mission because it's going to take almost... Uh, 10 minutes, 11 minutes to get one direction for me to say hello to you on earth. And then another 11 minutes for you to say hello back. Um, wow. And so that's going to limit communication and change dramatically how you communicate on board the space station. I could use the internet protocol phone and call home and talk to family and friends. And so I really didn't feel particularly isolated, but I do think that as we move further and further away, that those challenges of communication and maintaining contact with your family is gonna be much more challenging. And I think you have said in the past that when you were there, you said you could call them, but they couldn't call you. So it was always on your schedule. <laughs> that was yeah. yeah, it was perfect as far as I was gonna say. <laughs> Another benefit. Um, okay, let's see what the next question is. From Kishore, do you have to learn how to fly a plane to fly a rocket? And that is actually from Arisha, who's nine years old. Good question. Yeah. And no, you don't have to be a pilot to uh, be an astronaut. What we do at, once we are selected as astronauts is we get training in all the fields that we might not have a lot of experience in. So I, I did do I did have my private pilot's license but I'd never flown in a jet. And so I get training in a jet and I had never, you know, run emergency procedures like for fire. And I had to learn how to do those, but I knew how to do many of the scientific activities and other astronauts would have to learn how to do those. So everybody gets trained up so that they can do everything on board as an astronaut. But you, do, hap you do happen to be a pilot. I do. I yeah. did. I learned yeah. to fly. Uh, I got my li license when I was 20. Right. Wow. Amazing. Um, okay. Let's see the next question. From Justin, thank you for being a national treasure. I'm an ex-space Xer who worked on both Dragon capsules, uh, both Dragon capsules. What was your favorite care package in space? What a great question. Uh, would you come out of retirement to ride Dragon 2? Two questions there. So let's take the first. What was your favorite care package? Oh. We got ice cream one time. That was that was probably pretty special for me. Um, you know, they sent up a, a freezer that was going uphill, empty, and coming home with scientific data, and so they filled it up with <laughs> ice cream. So that was that was the most fun fun thing that we ever got uh, in space. In terms of yes, I, I would definitely uh, come out of retirement to fly on a dragon. In fact, I'm actually consulting with Axiom Space. And the vehicle that they plan on using to take customers to orbit is uh, the Dragon. Wow, that's amazing. You have said you'd go back in a heartbeat. I mean, you're, you're on record as saying that. So um, <laughs> that's great. Um, okay, let's see the next question. Uh, did one of your friends go to NASA? Uh, this is also from Arisha, age nine. So I, you know, I started working at NASA as soon as I finished my PhD. So many of my friends were at NASA, became my friends at NASA. I kind of grew up at NASA. So uh, the only person that I knew that uh, already worked at NASA that I was close to was my boyfriend at the time. <laughs> He's now my husband. So, <laughs> so yeah, I had a little connection there. <laughs> That's great. Um, all right, let's see the next question. From Edgar, as a biologist, do you think it will ever be feasible to terraform planets and moons in the solar system and beyond to replicate our biosphere? Terraform. I'm an English major, so you may have to define that one. <laughs> uh, terraform means to make it into a habitable or, oh, you know, or vegetation. Livable. For, yeah, vegetative, you know, place. And um, so, yes, I do think it would be possible. Uh, I think many of those activities would take a very long time. Um, so I, I envision us having to have habitats or other, other uh, facilities much smaller uh, until we get 
until we can terraform a large area. I don't, I think that might be pretty challenging, but give us another 20 or 30 years and some good scientists out there working on it. <laughs> Maybe some of the young people who are listening to us right now. Uh, let's see the next question. From Grace, thank you for joining us today. After a visit to space, how long does it typically take for you to adjust to life back on Earth? Any daily activities for you that take longer to feel normal? Thank you, Grace. Grace and I work together. Uh, it's a great question, actually. Uh, when you first get back uh, from a long duration space flight, uh, it's kind of challenging initially because you're you're not used to gravity anymore. So everything's heavy. Your arm is heavy. You know, your head is heavy. Uh, and so it, it takes a bit to adjust. But within the first day or so, you're like, OK, I'm back on Earth. Uh, but it's interesting to me, we do 45 days of reconditioning and it's largely to teach the small balance muscles how to work again, like, you know, around your knees and your ankles. So we do all these funky exercises where we stand on, on uh, squishy surfaces and throw weighted medicine balls at the wall and catch them uh, to try and activate all those muscles and remind your brain how, how they're all supposed to work together. We do two hours a day of exercise on board the space station. So we're actually very strong from uh, just the big muscle groups, but I just don't feel particularly coordinated when I first get back. And and then you have that whole, you know, readapting to throwing something in a trash can and having to readjust for <laughs> gravity again. <laughs> That's amazing. And why do they call you American Space Ninja? <laughs> Uh, it, it came about um, Jack uh, Fisher, who was on my last flight with me. He he decided when I broke the record to call me the Space Ninja. He's got a, a nickname for everybody, <laughs> and so he he came up with Space Ninja, and he he wanted the ground team to call me the Space Ninja. So he was talking about the Ninja all the time, and eventually the ground team would refer to me as the Space Ninja as well. <laughs> I love it. I think it's stuck. Um, so let's uh, have another question. I think we have time for one or two more uh, from Isha. Can you talk about your experience with the Space Flights Experiments Program, SSEP, and how it fits into larger STEM education initiatives? I actually participated myself in high school. This is a great question. And we didn't really touch on STEM efforts. Um, so I'll let you answer that. Yeah, so there's a number of different um, programs uh, and STEM initiatives. So I even launched little satellites from a launcher on board the space station that were uh, developed by different high schools and colleges. I grew little plants and con small containers, they called them uh, CubeSats or NanoRacks, small experiments from various schools. And I think all of those are good. Uh, and we need to get more and more out there so that uh, young people can actually directly participate in doing scientific research. Uh, it's not that I think everyone should be an astronaut because not everybody's interested in that, but there's a lot of really interesting research going on. And I'd, I'd like to encourage as much of that as possible. And the engineering required just to have a space station is pretty amazing as well. So I think it's important uh, to encourage our young people uh, in all those fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. And, you know, we typically refer to it as STEAM, STEM, but I think there is a STEAM component to it, uh, adding the arts as well, because all of it is uh, gives you a, a perspective on space and, and who we are, where we come from. Absolutely. Uh, let's take another question. These are really good questions. From Tammy, have you seen the TV show For All Mankind? And if so, what do you think of its alternative version of history? I actually just started watching that and I, I love it. I think it's interesting to think about the fact that, you know, if we came in second, would we have tried harder? Would we have pushed harder? Would we have explored more, done more? And um, it's, I think, a really interesting concept for a TV show, but it, it also is something, you know, you can think about when uh, you, you think about, do I want to fail at something? Well, sometimes when you fail at something, you end up being better in the end. 
And so we can take it on as a message to ourselves that don't let failure hold you back. Learn from it. Make make yourself better because of it. That's great. And let's take another. I think we have a few more. From Michael, what is the hardest part about coming back to Earth from space? From Allie, age nine. And you touched on this a little bit, but what would you say is the single hardest part? Gravity. <laughs> It really is. <laughs> it really is. Gravity is makes you so heavy. It's the hardest part. Wow. I just, you know, be so interesting to experience this. I mean, it really, it's fascinating. Um, okay, there you have it. Um, and let's take another question from Komal. Oh, this is from Araya, who is seven. How did you become a commander? And you did you always know you wanted to be one? Great question. Yeah, it's a great, great question. I didn't know I always wanted to be a commander. On my first flight, I want, I knew I wanted to go be an astronaut and go into space. And so I was very interested in that. When I came back from my first mission, though, I really thought, hey, I think I could command uh, a mission. And uh, I, I told my boss at the time that I would like to. I would like to try and do whatever job he needed me to do to prove that I could command a mission. And so he made me his deputy. <laughs> and uh, so I, I got to work with him directly and prove to him that I, I had the right leadership skills to be able to command. So it, it wasn't something that I always knew I wanted to do. Uh, but after I had done my first flight, I thought the next challenge was being command. There is a real um, theme here, which is you followed your passion. And, you know, it sort of strikes to the adage, when you do what you love, you know, success will follow. If you do what really just draws you and what you're super passionate ab about, um, you know, that, that success kind of naturally follows. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, I think that's probably very true. I, I, I do caution you to think that it, it was never a straight line for me. I never got what I wanted as soon as I wanted it. <laughs> and it, it was something that required that uh, work ethic and that dedication and that determination to, to try and get to those final goals. Um, and then when you get to that final goal, then you find, oh, there's something else I want to try and do. And just continuing to be drawn to the next thing uh, and working toward that, I think, is important. But it's it's important to know your passion and to follow it. And I think we have one more question from Leon. Can you share a little bit about what goes through your mind as you sit there in the cockpit waiting for liftoff? Fantastic question. What goes through your mind in that moment? Well, it's funny because on my first launch uh, in the space shuttle, we got to L minus nine minutes and then there's a what's called a built-in hold. And that means they stop the clock just in case they need to fix something or have a little bit of time because the launch window actually has to happen at a specific time. So they build in a, a hold. And during that nine minutes, uh, a thunderstorm moved in and, and it got within 25 miles. And so we had to scrub the launch. Oh. And so then the next time I was on the launch pad three weeks later <laughs> and you're waiting for it, and you get back down and the nine minute clock starts counting down. And I'm like, oh, I think I'm really going to go. <laughs> it's like for the first time, I think I really believed I was going to go into space because you train so many years. I, you know, the basic training once I was selected was two years long. And then when I was picked for a specific flight, it was another three years worth of training. And after a while, you start to believe that it's all just a training event and you're never really actually going to end up in space. And, and you're even so, then you're feeling is excitement. <laughs> it's not nervousness. You're just excited. Yeah. Like we're really, yeah, gonna it's, go. like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And so wow. it was, it, it was a lot of, uh, of course there's huge exhilaration in, in the space shuttle uh, six seconds before the launch, the, uh, three main engines, which are the liquid fueled engines on the back of the shuttle, are ignited and they have to be up to a hundred percent and uh they get to a hundred percent by the time the clock gets to zero and then the 
solid rocket boosters ignite. And there is absolutely no question that you're not going somewhere at that point because <laughs> the acceleration, the vibration is such that you, you don't forget it. But what's amazing is you go from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in about eight and a half minutes. Wow, that's unbelievable. That's amazing. So let me ask you, now that you're retired from NASA, what fills your time and what do you want to do next? So I'm consulting with Axiom Space and uh, I've been assigned to be the backup commander for the first flight, commercial flight to the International Space Station. So hopefully there will be a future flight in, in store for me. That's amazing. We will be watching. Um, since you're here at Google, I think we have to ask you, is there a Google product that you can't live without? Oh, well, I love the Google search engines and the, um, uh, the maps. The maps are <laughs> the, my favorite, I, a lifesaver. <laughs> That's great. And then um, lastly, once it's safe to travel, regular travel, not space travel, which may not be as exciting for you, um, where do you want to go first? I think I want to see some of the friends that I've just been talking to and FaceTiming with for the last year and, you know, just reconnect in person. Yeah, I think I think we all feel the same way. Um, well, Peggy, you have given us so much to think about today and so much wisdom and experience. Thank you for your time and for being here with us at Google. And thank you to all the great questions out there, especially to all the children out there who tuned in and who asked questions. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thanks.